Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Guys, we have a really special person here today. Somebody that, uh, you know this guy, his name is Jason Fung. I don't know if you guys ever heard of him, uh, who comes highly recommended from him. Um, he, his name is Dr. George Kondrut. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, yeah, Kondrut. Kondrut, yeah. okay, perfect. Dr. George Kondrut. And he is, uh, uh, you know, he has a very interesting career. He started his career, uh, uh, his education in biochemistry at the University of Ottawa. He went on to medical school um, and did his family medicine uh, residency, and he's board certified in family medicine at the University of Ottawa as well. And uh, he is a fellow uh, low carb and fasting and keto proponent. So, uh, welcome, welcome to the Low Carb MD podcast. Uh, we're happy to have you here. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tro. Uh, glad to uh, finally meet you. I, uh, I'm a longtime listener uh, to your podcast, so uh, it's a real uh, honor to be to be on here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we were just talking before we went live, but I wanted to capture it. Um, you know, how did you get in? So, you know, I I know what it's like to be uh, trained in. You know, I'm internal medicine trained. I know what they teach us in terms of uh, in primary care about nutrition. So all this fasting stuff and low carb stuff, this is not what they taught you. So, uh, how did you find your way going from a, you know, family medicine doctor to wait a second, maybe there's something to fasting and, uh, um, low carb. Uh, so it was, it was little by little, uh, you know, it was, um, um, I, I saw some patients that did keto and did very well. Um, and this was, uh, back in 2018 or so I, uh, I was, I was curious about this idea of fasting and keto. Um, I, I read Dr. Fung's book, uh, the complete guide to fasting and, um, sort of put it in the back of my mind. Um, then I started listening to a lot of podcasts like, like your own, uh, like the diet doctor, uh, uh podcast. And then, uh, the Peter Atia podcast as well, uh, back in 2018. So, um, it became, um, uh, why well, I became curious about it because I, I thought, you know, the teaching I was getting was, uh, diabetes is a progressive disease. It's irreversible. Uh, same with obesity aside from, uh, gastric bypass. Uh, uh, there's not much you can do to, to reverse it. Um, and yet, uh, you know, I saw people that, um, you know, I saw one patient that was on 200 units of insulin. Um, and then she, she underwent, uh, gastric cancer surgery, um, and lost a lot of weight and went off all the insulin, including the metformin. She reversed her diabetes. You know, she did very well with the, with the cancer. Um, so uh, you know, then, then I was, I was, I was looking, you know, my personal life with, with my dad, he, he was a type two diabetic on insulin. Um, and he was told that he had type one and a half diabetes, um, which, uh, you know, I was kind of curious about, I didn't know what that meant or why they would tell him he has, he had that. Uh, I looked at through his blood work. He, he didn't have antibodies to, uh, pancreatic antibodies or anything. And he was just on insulin no metformin. And every time I saw him, he, he gained more weight and he was on more insulin. And he kept telling me he's eating uh, sugar free cookies to, to keep his sugar from going too low. And I kept telling him, you know, carbohydrates are sugar. <laughs> and it never seemed to, uh, to really stick with him. Um, so this, this, uh, this all sort of came to a head back. Uh, uh, so uh, Christmas time 2018 2019, when uh, I sort of sat him down and I told him everything I was learning about fasting and insulin resistance and, and so on. And, uh, you know, he went low carb, he went off his insulin, he lost 55 pounds. Um, and, you know, so I, I saw it firsthand in, in, in my dad, 
before I started to sort of talk to my patients about it uh, to some extent. And so, so uh, I'm just yeah. I'm just curious here. Okay, so so you're exposed through a patient, you see it through a patient, and this is three years ago. You had read a little bit about fasting, so you kind of had a some concept of it, but then your father is diagnosed with. Uh, you know, we, we, it's called type one and a half. It could be called late onset, uh, you know, LADA uh, or Modi, uh, you know, maturity onset diabetes of the young, or it's also called flatbush diabetes. You know, there's this area nearby where we, where we, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it actually, that's the flatbush diabetes is one of the first whole area of Brooklyn where everybody has type one and a half, you know, uh, very low really? insulin yeah. production. And so your father gets this, you see him gain weight and you're like, we can't keep doing this. Yeah. Right? So, all right. Yeah. And, and so now you're probably learning about it, um, about different approaches. And that was right around the time, I think 2019, when the ADA changed the guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, how did you go about finding information to help your dad? Um, so again, it was, it was a lot of my own research and reading, uh, around it. Um, he, he had tried, you know, uh, sort of crash diets, like, uh, hypocaloric diets in the past and lost weight. Um, uh, you know, I mean, prior to this, I was advising my patients to, you know, watch their sugar, watch their carbs and eat small, frequent meals, you know? Um, so the fasting part, the time restricted eating, the, the intermittent fasting part really, was key to, to what he did and how it worked for him. Um, and, you know, I, I'd, I'd be talking to him, texting with him all the time. And um, as I say, like he, he went off his insulin right off the bat because he, his sugar was, his sugars were low. They were normal. Right. So. So, so you looked into it and when you did your own research, I mean, where did you, where did you turn to? Did you, like, I remember going back to the primary literature, um, and looking, you know, what diets work, what has the best effect on A1C, and, and, you know, where did you get your information from? Because I know that if you open up Harrison's, uh, I don't know, I may have sold Harrison's, but I'm looking to see if I have it nearby. But uh, if you have, uh, if you have Harris, you know, if you open up Harrison's, it doesn't really talk about carbohydrate restriction. Mm -hmm. So, but it is in the primary medical literature, I mean, where did you go to learn about this? Yeah. Well, that's 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 the problem, right? Like, it's not in uh, medical education. It's not in the um, um, you know the the continual continuing medical education conferences I go to. There there was one talk that I that I attended um, at one of these CME events where they sort of uh, they put the seed of doubt uh, in my mind about the whole. Uh, you know, fat is bad uh, hypothesis. They talked about Ansel Keys and so on. And uh, it, it, it sort of, yeah, it, this was, I think, 2018 as well. It sort of blew my mind. Like, I, I didn't know that there was this other, um, uh, yeah, this other interpretation of the data, right? Uh, so that, again, that put the seed in my mind. Then I saw my patients. I saw a patient. He, uh, um, he did keto, he lost all this weight. And I thought it makes sense, you know, like why, uh, uh, where are the dangers? Right. So, so I was always, always thinking about that as well. So, okay. You were looking up the dangers. I, I almost did the exact same thing. You go to the literature, maybe you see a uh, slightly increase or you see, uh, in the acute setting, higher urine electrolytes, think about, you know, kidney stones, Mm -hmm. uh, and want to do that, you look at the literature that higher fat di diets may be associated with slightly higher LDL. Uh, so how do you go, like, what do you, I, I mean, you strike me as an evidence-based guy. Um, so how are you gathering, um, you know, I, I mean, look, if dad's going to go on this diet, I'm sure you want to make sure it's, you know, not going to give him kidney failure and ketoacidosis and you know, uh, uh, kidney stones and, you know, heart attack. Right. So, yeah, yeah. so how do you, I mean, I'm just trying to understand, you know, what happens, you know, uh, you know, what happens there? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, uh, it's funny. I, I wrote him a little, 
uh, a health plan. Even back then, you know, I said, look, this is what you have to do. Uh, you have to talk to your doctor. You have to get them on board. You have to adjust your insulin. You have to try and get back on metformin. You have to check your your labs. Um, I mean, I didn't really want to, uh, you know, take over his care, obviously, right? Like, I, uh, yeah. he's got his own doctors and everything. Um but, but they don't know, you know anything about low carb eating, I'm sure, right? They, so. they they don't, they don't. And his his doctor was was astounded, you know. <laughs> he gave him a big hug when he saw him after he he'd lost uh, 20, 30 pounds. He said, you know, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Um so you know, yeah. <laughs> so that must have been a, a a big so so now you're okay, so so he comes off of insulin, he's losing weight, and uh and uh, you're looking into the literature, making sure it's safe for him. How do yeah. you go from practicing? Now you've seen this, right? You saw that yeah. you mentioned the patient with gastric cancer, your other patient who lost weight, and your father mm -hmm. now off of insulin or coming off of insulin. How does that translate into how you care for your patients and your, your practice? Yeah. So, so you know, uh, prior to this, I was telling them to, to watch their sugar, watch their carbs, if they had diabetes or obesity. Uh, and to eat uh, frequent meals, you know, a large meal, a small meal, alternating like that. Um, and and I, I went from that to, to telling them to extend their overnight fast, to make sure they're not eating before bedtime, at least three, four hours, um, and to extend the fast after they wake up. So push breakfast back as far as they can, uh, you know, have that, that fasting, overnight fast at least 12 hours, if not 16 or 18 um, and that's simple advice, you know, um, again, with being mindful of sugars and, and carbohydrates, but that simple advice of doing time restricted eating, uh, basically resulted in me seeing my patients come back, you know, a few months later, three, four months later and telling me, Oh, I did that. It was hard for two weeks, but I lost 20 pounds. I lost 30 pounds. And it, this was happening once or twice a week. And I, I just couldn't believe it. You know, I just, for, first of all, I couldn't believe they were listening to me. <laughs> uh, and, and secondly, I couldn't believe that advice had actually worked. Um, so I'm, I started sort of tracking them just to see um, and, and sort of maintaining a, a spreadsheet to make, to make sure that, you know, it's not temporary. Um, you know, also looking at, uh, you know, their, their markers, their, their LDL, their, their A1C, their ALTs, uh, all these things. Um, and yeah, so I was, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe it. So, okay. So here you are, you're seeing your patients. So, so they're doing low carb and intermittent fasting, the combination of these two, and mm -hmm. you're seeing that the results are powerful. Um, mm -hmm. what do your colleagues say? You must work in a clinic with other doctors. Yeah. You must think you're <laughs> crazy now, right? Yeah, well, no, they they've heard me. Uh, they've heard me talk about Jason Fung uh, many times. I mean, I, I I got three of them to to read uh, Jason Fung's work, and uh, one of them is actually you know implementing this with his patients as well. Uh, you know, more along um, sort of a plant based diet approach. Um, uh, one of the doctors that actually she's retired now, but she was she was handing out. Uh, you know, the obesity code to people. <laughs> um, so uh, some, some, you know, some got converted in that sense and they understand sort of the, the, the there's a physiological um, rationale there. It's not, uh, it's not a crazy diet. It's not a crash diet. It, it makes sense. Uh, in fact, you know, the obesity code, I mean, that's written for GPs, like to, to my mind, that, that is um uh, like you sort of need to know something about medicine to understand that book. And a lot of the, uh, the medications that he, he describes there, the uh, GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s, they, it makes sense why they work by lowering insulin. Uh, and it makes sense, you know, with his, um, uh, you know, uh, carbohydrate insulin model, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the, both, both the obesity code and the diabetes code, I mean, these what what Jason Fung does so well is he takes uh, the uh, what I call mosaic theory. Basically, he brings in to get you know disparate pieces of information together, and he just presents it in a way that makes sense in plain language, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm I agree with you absolutely. You know we should give the you know uh, the obesity code and diabetes code basically to every resident 
just to read, you know, just to read and have a different viewpoint. I mean, everybody knows low fat, low energy, every single person, right? But to understand um, kind of the hormonal basis for some of these is so important. So, so, okay, so now you've, you know, you're evangelizing people in your practice, you're evangelizing, <laughs> you know, your, your other people. And I'm just, you know, curious, um, you know, we've had other doctors from Canada come and say they faced extreme hardship, you know, uh, preaching a low carb message there. You know, we've had, uh, Evelyn Boudoir Roy come on and talk about that on the podcast, uh, We've had, um, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, other doctors basically say how they've been, you know, Gary Fedke, Tim Noakes, um, you know, myself and Brian have talked a lot about that. Certainly Jason Fung has come under heat for his message. You know, at any point, did anybody say you're going to kill somebody? It's crazy what you're doing. Did you face any backlash? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, not, not, I, can't, I can't think of an example. I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, again, like I'm very, uh, you know, uh, moderate, I would say on, on, on my advice, you know, again, it's, it's very minimal time restricted eating. Now I have some patients who really run with it, right. They'll do the prolonged fasts. They'll do ultra low carb, right. They'll do keto, right. Um, I don't, I don't get scared if I see that again, I, I look for certain things, um, I, I, I haven't had backlash yet, you know, but I have had, you know, sort of questions, right? Like I, uh, you know, out of the patients that I follow, the, the men do a lot better than the women. Right. Uh, and I want to know why, why am I, am I doing something wrong? Are they doing something wrong? Why doesn't it, why does, doesn't this work for everybody? Right. Um, I have patients who are, you know, struggling and there, it, it doesn't seem to be working for them. So, um, you know, I, I refer them to the weight loss clinic. I refer them to, you know, for gastric bypass, like, um, yeah. So I, I, I you know, I haven't, I haven't gotten in trouble yet. So <laughs> got it. Yeah. You're, you're one of the lucky ones. Well, I think now is a different time. So, you know, um, you know, four or five years ago when I started delving into this and, and even like two and a half years ago, wow, we're going to come on has it been two years or three years on this podcast? I don't even know anymore. Uh, you know, initially we, we faced a lot of heat, but then since then I know uh, Diabetes Canada uh, was a little more supportive of uh, low carbohydrate or car carb approaches. The ADA came out obviously more supportive in 2019. So some of the landscape is changing a little bit. Um, so maybe you just kind of never, never experienced that, um, which is good. That's a good thing. Uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, have faced that kind of hardship, but yeah, I, 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 I do see that too, you know, uh, particularly postmenopausal women, you know, seem to, um, you know, uh, struggle and we do see a lot of men, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll have men and, you know, the, the couple come in and, you know, uh, the man loses like, you know, almost, I don't know, 50% more than the, the, the woman. Yeah, um, yeah. So have you uh, changed your change your advice to to, you know, or how do you advise people when you see something like that? Um, well, I mean, I, I tell them I tell them to expect that. I mean, I think most most people know men lose weight a lot easier than women. I mean, women certainly do. Uh, I think, you know, it's also how how much dieting has, has happened in their past as well. Um, and then I tell them, look, I mean, it, you don't need to lose a lot of weight to, to have better metabolic health. You know, you can, you can lose 5%, 10% of your body weight. You can, uh, you know, reverse your fatty liver and, and, you know, that's where you get your benefit. It's not about, uh, you know, your perfect BMI or, uh, to look good on the beach kind of thing. Right. Uh, you can, you can get healthy, um, uh, before that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, it's funny you say that because I, I think one of the other things is, uh, the expectation, right? You know, if you have a six foot tall man, you know, versus a five foot two, you know, woman, right. Uh, that six foot tall man is going to, you know, one, he has testosterone. Uh, so there's metabolic issues at play, hormonal issues at play. And two, he's just taller and bigger. 
mm -hmm. right? And so if you have somebody who's smaller and, and um, they'll eat the same amount of food and have two different results, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they'll have two different results. And I find, and I don't know if you find this, but I'm curious to see what you think, that the pressure on women to lose weight is much more than men. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is an intense societal pressure for women to lose weight and, and maintain it off. And in fact, you know, sometimes I get these couples that come in and the men don't even care, you know, <laughs> like yeah. they're just, they just eat whatever the wife cooks, you know, and they're losing weight. Right. And, and it really, I, you know, I don't know if I'm overgeneralizing, but I think there's a lot of pressure on women to lose more weight and have a certain figure. To some extent, it's changed now uh, where, where, you know, those pressures are being put on men. But I think historically, at least, you know, there was a lot of a lot of pressure on women. Do you think that those things play a factor? Um, I mean, yeah, I, th I think they probably do. Right. Like, uh, um, you know, that's the other thing. Like, I, I, I look at a patient and I don't even think they're overweight. They don't have diabetes. Right. But then when I look closer at their metabolic health. Like I have a couple of uh, men that I, I never thought they were overweight or they certainly weren't pre-diabetic. Uh, but when I looked closer, uh, you know, we it, they weren't optimized, let's say. <laughs> yeah. um, you and, mean like the and, triglycerides were high and the HDL was low and the vitamin D was low and the, what, what do you well, mean by that? Yeah. Yeah, well, it was just, um, uh, you know, I had, you know, a couple of patients, again, they, they, it wasn't even metabolic health that was their main issue. Well, one of them, uh, with pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, I happened to check his fasting insulin and it was sky high, his inflammatory markers sky high. And then I, I thought, you know what, you could lose 20 pounds. And sure enough, he, he implemented this lifestyle, very low carb, intermittent fasting. Uh, his insulin went all the way down. His a, uh, ALT went all the way down to normal. His inflammatory markers over time, over six months corrected. And then his pulmonary function tests improved. Uh, by 30%. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I was, I was blown away. Um, I have another patient like that, similar. Like uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a weight loss, obesity, diabetes thing. It was, um, it was back pain from like the degenerative, the degenerative discs. And um, we had an MRI that showed uh, epidural lipomatosis. So, so fat within the, the spinal canal that was, you know, causing a functional... Um, um stenosis let's say uh and he improved th the same way with with losing the weight you know losing 20 30 pounds he improved in his back pain you know it was it was it was amazing like i i, I haven't heard about that before um so uh you know again like i i don't know um uh the 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 gender thing i don't know how you guys um manage that or what, what do you think about that well, no, no, no. I mean, these are amazing cases you're talking about. Let's focus on those for a second. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I certainly think that, uh, well, it sounds like what's going on underneath the hood. Let's look at that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis case. First of all, idiopathic guys, just so you know, means doctors don't know and we don't know, right? So idiopathic basically means we don't know, right? So we don't know why. If you hear the word idiopathic, just imagine it actually what we're actually saying is we don't know why there's pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary fibrosis is a fancy way of saying lung you know uh, uh the architecture of the lung becoming more fibrotic being more stiffened so so here you are you have somebody who has you know idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis sometimes we put them on steroids sometimes you know um and you see his inflammatory markers are through the roof you see his influence through the roof and it's not like he's wildly obese, but certainly we know if you take weight off of the thoracic, you know, space that, you know, he's going to have less restriction, right? So he's going to, his, his lungs are going to improve. So if you're like, okay, maybe I'll decrease his insulin, decrease his inflammation, put him on low carb, but lose a couple pounds, but a 30% increase in lung function. I mean, we don't typically see that with a 20 pound, you know, uh, yeah. reduction. So wh what happened? What happened to him? What, what did it, how did you start him? What did, how did his life change? What did he do? How long did that take? I'm just, I'm kind it, of intrigued it didn't, by this. It didn't, uh, it didn't take long actually, because he really took to the, uh, the diet and the lifestyle and 
Um, you know, again, I tell people to watch uh, uh, Jason Fung's YouTube lectures and read his books and, and so on. Uh, so within two, three months, I mean, he had started losing the weight. Uh, his, some of his inflammatory markers were still high. And then, um, you know, I just, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe part of it is autophagy, you know, because pulmonary fibrosis has impaired autophagy. So, uh, you know, I, that's just sort of a, a, a question I have. Um, then, so, so then he sort of plateaued um, and he started gaining a little bit of weight back. We looked at his uh, diet again. We looked at uh, what he was doing, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking to him like once a month or once every two months. And I'm sure um, he's exercising his, too, right? You know, he's he's ex exercising five times a week. He's back to cycling, um, and he's um, he's got a respirologist that's following him. You know, I mean, he's had this for a long time. Uh, he, you know, they they cut out the um, feather pillows in his uh, environment, right? In his, yeah. uh, they're treating aggressively his acid reflux, you know, so that might have gotten better with the weight loss. Um, so I, I, uh, yeah, it's it's just uh, it's it's amazing. Like I don't know, I I never seen that before with with this condition. So, so guys, just so you understand, uh, the approach to that is you're trying to remove the chronic insults in this guy's the anything that would insult the lungs and. If you go to sleep and have reflux and that those reflux goes into the lungs, you know, that, that, that gastric content, it's going to aggravate the lungs. And certainly we wouldn't want that. We don't want that in asthma. We don't want that in, in most people. Uh, so it sounds like they're treating this, you know, treating that they got rid, maybe they're worried about allergic components, uh, uh, those feathers in his pillows. So they got rid of that. And, uh, but, but still, I mean, this is a unique kind of signal you know, uh, he goes low carb, his inflammation drops, you know, and his lung function improves. I hope, uh, you know, I mean, this is kind of a, a, a very, very interesting. I hope you guys write it up. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanna, I'm going to write a letter to his uh, respirologist to see what, what she thinks, because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really amazed by, by his progress. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll be happy to work with you to get that into the literature. I think that that's... Uh, you know, something that we need to do uh, as we mm -hmm. see more and more of these things. And then you mentioned uh, your other patient, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of the clinical improvement there. I mean, have you seen any other, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of allergy symptoms improved. I'm just, just anecdotally, we've heard a lot of reflux improved, joint pains. Any other things that you've noticed in this low carb intermittent fasting approach uh, where people's, uh, you know, just symptoms you didn't expect to improve did or, or it, it makes sense if there's fat in somebody's spinal cord and you put them on a low carb intermittent fasting diet that maybe that fat would shrink. Yeah. Uh, but, I just uh, didn't think that was a place that fat would go in the spinal cord. That's an odd place for, yeah, for it to it, be deposited, right? Like It is. Uh, I, uh, I mean, these are sort of my, my star uh, patients that I've had, you know, that I followed. And again, I, I maintain this, uh, you know, some people, they lose the weight and then they go back to the old ways. They regain the weight. It's just like anything else, right? It's, um, um, I go back to my, uh, my spreadsheet and I update it and, you know, somebody lost, you know, eight kilos. Now it's actually, they regained it all. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a process for sure. Yeah. I mean, how do you, so I think that's the other part, right? I know, uh, in the, Canadian model that there's different, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit more restriction in terms of what you can and can do. Um, you know, we can actually see some patients very frequently text them, email them, engage them in group meetings and stuff like that. How do you keep your patients engaged? I mean, I'm sure you've seen like with anything else in this modern food environment, what's most likely the thing that's going to happen. People are going to regress to that modern food environment, right? So how do you keep, you know, I mean, it sounds like you've already seen much of what we've seen, which is, you know, sometimes people fall off, you mm -hmm. know, how yeah. do you, uh, you know, how do you reach out to those people? Uh, well, you know, I mean, if they're, if they're diabetics, right, if they have diabetes, they, uh, they're supposed to follow up every three months or six months if they're well controlled. Um, so I see them periodically through that, right? Um, and then just through general, um, you know, follow-ups. Now, in the last year, you know, we're doing a lot more uh, video calls and phone calls and emails and things like that. So 
uh, it's easier to keep in touch and in, in touch with people. Um, um, yeah, and I would say the volume is the exact same as before. Um, how do I keep them from the modern food environment? I mean, it's actually, it's been easier since people are at home more and they're not celebrating with family for every holiday and they're not feasting all the time. Uh, a lot of people uh, find it easier to maintain this diet. And even some people who, um, you know, for example, with alcohol use, right? Uh, some people who are trying to quit their alcohol use, it's been much easier for them to do that now since everyone's isolating and uh, staying at home. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that split. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, I've seen a pretty clear split. The people who had the mental drive and were socially driven, right? Mm -hmm. Were like had that social drive to eat and drink. Those people have improved, you know, mm -hmm. where they they couldn't fight. They have an internal desire, but they that um, those external pressures really were kind of messing with it. The the other side that I've seen are people who are just stressed out, have mental health issues, stress issues. They've like delved back, right? They're just stressed out people looking for comfort. And the easiest mm -hmm. comfort in our homes is food, one. And then two is the alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we, we've seen this ac across the board, this like kind of split uh, where you have those people that have lost no, you know, who've gained no weight, you know, and it improved, you know, during COVID. And then yeah. there's people really suffering. Um, and that's why we've tried to bring people in a community format, uh, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, we all need that support, you know, mm. uh, at, at different times. Um, so that's interesting. Okay. So, and, and uh, as you know, you've gone virtual, I'm sure, you know, I, I'm curious, have patients come to you now they know you do low carb. Now they know you kind of focus in on diabetes and fasting. Have they asked you for see how tough is it to get a patient, a, a continuous glucose monitor in Canada? I'm just curious, you know, mm, uh, I have a type one diabetic that managed to get one through uh, the Dexcom uh, right. through his uh, endocrinologist and insurance. Uh, we have this uh, freestyle Libre. So uh, that's, you know, that's available. It's, I don't know. I haven't really gotten that on. Uh, I haven't really pushed for that. I don't know. <laughs> Got it. You know, we have, cause I can't tell you how many patients we've had contact us from uh, Canada. They're like, can you send us, you know, Libres? And I'm like, no, we can't do that. You know, uh, yeah. you know, we're not licensed because uh, from what it sounds like people, it's very tough to get a hold of a CGM um, yeah. maybe because of insurance or something like that. Um, yeah, no, I think I think you can buy the freestyle Libre because you can just buy them, right? Uh, but they're expensive. Like right? they're um, those those um, sensors are expensive, right? That you apply, and also from what I hear, they're, they're not that accurate. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for for somebody like you know your dad who probably who may or may not inject insulin, I we always have them confirm. You know, they're plus or minus twenty, uh, but it looks like you know for. Yeah. Yeah, well, 20, 20 milligrams per deciliter. So for you, that yeah. would be, I guess, half a millimolar or so, mm -hmm. roughly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for like the hobby, you know, the pre-diabetic diabetic, to see the impact of the, you know, the rice and the bread that we're told to eat, the whole grain rice and bread, um, yeah. you know, that that's. Uh, it shows that pretty well, pretty nicely. Have you, yeah. have you found that useful with your patients? Like, is it motivating for them to see that? Hugely motivating, right? To be, yeah. to see, and here's the other thing, you know, why should they trust you and me? Uh, uh, why should they trust you and me when we say don't eat that way, right? If the guidelines have said eat, you know, whole grains and, you know, if, if you know, they've been told that, uh, by a plant-based proponent that eggs will cause diabetes, right? So yeah. why should they trust us? Or butter is good or butter is bad or eggs are good now, or eggs are bad. Why should they trust us? So I found that it's a, it's an immediate feedback. Here you go. If you have diabetes, go eat eggs and let me know how, what happens to your diabetes. Go eat, you know, use almond flour instead of flour and let me know what happens to your sugar. Um, mm. I think it's a way, and it also gives the patient uh, immediate feedback, like how am I mm -hmm. doing? How stable are my sugars? Um, mm -hmm. Versus, you know, having to wait for a scale that could take weeks to really drop. 
you know, in some yeah. cases, you know, that postmenopausal woman you were talking about who struggles with that weight loss, but to see that they're on track and their blood sugars are in a good place and, you know, to see that in real time, it's, it's, we find it, I find it valuable, but you're right. It's expensive. It's, you know, 35 yeah. bucks a sensor. I think Canadian, how, how, long, like how long do they, how long do they keep using it? Oh, on average, our average user probably uses it a month to two months. Okay. Uh, and then they, then there, there's very little utility after that, right? If you're not a severe diabetic, right? Yeah. If you're a severe diabetic, there's a, a big utility. Some people like that instant feedback too, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to be able to see how they did today. Yeah. Right. Right. It's tough, you know, when you get on the scale and just cause you're a little constipated and a little, you ate a little bit of salt, you're holding on to more water and more stool, right? The number says you did bad. Yeah. Right. But when you look at that CGM and it says, wait a second, you did good. You know, I think that's a powerful, you know, that feedback yeah. is powerful. Uh, yeah, we've had a lot of, yeah. I mean, is it cost effective? No. I mean, if I was in Canada, they'd probably, you know, put me in the, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. What do they have? They'd, they'd say, you know, <laughs> excessive prescription writing, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, have you, have you, have you found that your referrals to the weight loss clinic have decreased, you know, after you've kind of, mm, uh, I mean, they, they haven't, they haven't. Uh, I mean, the, the, some, some of my patients, the, the, the more difficult ones, um, they've been to the weight loss clinic, you know, they've been for a gastric bypass a surgery assessment and they said, no, no, you know, and then they end up going back, um, like there's, there's some cases that are really, really hard, you know? So, um, um, I, I, I will send them, you know, for example, um, or, or prescribe Saxenda, right? Saxenda and hopefully Ozempic, uh, soon enough. Right. Uh, that seems to work. That seems to get people going, uh, for, for some cases. Yeah, we, we, um, we, I'd say we have like a 5% uh, rate of, prescription drug use or, um, you know, a referral to gastric surgery. I mean, there's certainly some people that benefit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the GLP-1 drugs are probably the best in the bunch for diabetes. If somebody has weight to lose and they have diabetes, I have a very low, very low hesitancy. Obviously, if they have a thyroid issue or, you know, if they're heavy drinkers, I very rarely prescribe it you know, uh, because of that pancreatic, uh, inflammation. Um, but I, I like them, you know, they give people fullness. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's a real effect in, if you have somebody who's really good at low carb, I don't think the major, there's a huge effect, right. But, uh, the people who really benefit are the ones who get the nausea, you mm -hmm. know, oh, yeah. Get, yeah. you know what I mean? Like they just, they, if you're nauseous, you don't want to eat. It's like a fasting aid, I guess, to some extent. Right. Um, yeah. I've had a, a nephrologist from Canada actually tell me uh, a good doctor. He told me that he, he, he got a sense of fullness. He never otherwise got though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this has been great. This has been absolutely great. And thank you for coming on. Um, if people are listening to this podcast and, and, uh, they have an interest in kind of finding you, how would they get in touch with you? Um, so, um, I have, um, um, an, an email address that they can, they can email me at, uh, I'm not, I'm not looking to, to find more patients cause I'm, <laughs> I'm Got pretty it. busy okay. with my, my practice. Um, uh, well, any but, upcoming yeah, I mean, projects in the, in your practice, maybe hopefully we'll see, we can convince you to evangelize further, get some of these case reports in the literature because yeah, that, that would be that, that would pulmonary be fibrosis yeah. case. Uh, sounds very, very interesting. Um, and the reality is, is we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have enough data. We don't have enough clinical data. Um, so it'd be nice to see those things happen. So you're not looking for patients, but any, uh, anything else to expect from, uh, from the good doctor? Uh, no, just uh, hoping to keep learning uh, from you guys and uh, hoping to see medical education change. You know, um, I, I think, uh, as you said earlier, uh, you know, the guidelines are slowly changing um, and hopefully the education will change. I mean, I think society is 
slowly changing as well. Like, I mean, you can go to Costco and find low carb uh, keto treats and things like that. So people can easily substitute these days, whereas, you know, even two, three years ago, they couldn't. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's uh, very exciting to, um, to see this change in, in paradigm, right? And just, just a improvement in people's health, right? They can, they can take ownership over their own health and, and get healthier, right? Giving them hope and a way, right? Not just mm -hmm. uh, a hope and a way to achieve, uh, you know, a reversal of metabolic syndrome and diabetes and uh, maybe some weight loss. And in one case, pulmonary fibrosis, which is, I'm still amazed by that. That's amazing. You have to publish it. I'm going to get you to promise me right here. Yeah. Okay. We're going to publish well, if it. You, if, you, if you help, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You know what? That's yeah. a deal. I'll, I'll help you out. I'll get you. Uh, well, maybe we'll get an interested med student and myself. We'll work together. We'll put it out there. Yeah. This has been great. Thank you so much. And uh, um, I guess you're not looking for patience, but anywhere uh, uh, people can, uh, is there, are you on social media? Are you active on social media or anything like that? Uh, no, no, I'm no, not, not really. No, you're just like no. a good doctor. You're not like us showmen here. <laughs> you're a good clinician. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, uh, any friend of Jason Fung is a friend of ours. Yeah. Thank you, Tro. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Have a good this one. This is great. Yeah, you too.